Well, it is an incredible blessing for me to get to be with all of you uh, tonight, and the reason why is because I love Pastor David Rosales. Pastor David and Marie, they're, they're like heroes to me. How many think they're just fabulous, huh? <laughs> they just such awesome pastors. And it's always a blessing to be with all of you. So many of you, uh, through the years that we've been here to teach, uh, we have grown to love uh, so very, very much. How many of you brought a Bible with you tonight? Let's see all of the Bibles. And then, oh, this is so great. So glad you brought your Bible and you're here to study. Let's open in the Bible, if you will, to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. As I was praying about what the Lord would have us to study together tonight, he put it on my heart to have a study, this wonderful, this incredible, this amazing psalm. And the title of this message is Help in Times of Trouble. Help in times of trouble. As we come to study, let's pray together, and will you just, um, will you just hold your Bible up right there in front of you as we pray? God, we thank you so much for this book. It is the greatest book in the world. It is the most amazing book in all of human history. There are many other good books, but only this is a God book. We thank you so much for the Bible. It is light to our path. It is food when we are spiritually hungry. It is water when we are spiritually thirsty. It gives us hope and help and comfort and guidance and direction. We thank you, Lord, so much that every time we open this book, we don't open it alone, but your Holy Spirit comes alongside to teach us. And Lord, I pray tonight as we open your word together that your spirit that we have sung about would come into this room, would come into this place, and would make your word live. It would impact our minds. It would impact our hearts. And the things that we read, the things that we hear, the things we study, Lord, would have a permanent and a profound impact on each one of our lives. So bless us as we study. We'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. About 100 miles to the southeast of Salt Lake City, Utah, there is a town called Helper, Utah. Helper, Utah. And the origin of the name of that town is rather interesting. You see, many years ago in the era of the steam locomotive, locomotives out west would use what they called a helper. When a train would come to a very steep hill, a hill which in itself it was unable to climb, what they would do is they would take a much more powerful locomotive that they called a helper, And the train would attach itself to the back of the helper. And the helper would pull the entire train up that steep mountain, which was impossible for that train on its own to climb. And about 100 miles to the southeast of Salt Lake City in Carbon County, Utah, there is a very steep hill. It is one of the steepest inclines in the United States of America. For 15 miles, it goes up and up and up and up and up, and every time a train would come to the base of that soldier's summit, 7,500 feet up, it would be impossible for that train to climb that hill on its own. And so the train would be attached to the back of a helper 
and the helper would pull it up. The helpers were there at the base of the hill in Carbon County, Utah, so in 1881, they named that little town Helper, Utah. That is such a beautiful picture of God and us. Because there are many circumstances and situations in your life and mine that are like steep hills, that are like impossible mountains, that we could never, ever make it over on our own. But with the help of God, when we hook our lives, when we attach our lives to who God is and all He can do, He will help us through whatever trouble or trial or circumstance that we are facing. Before us in the Word of God tonight is a psalm that tells us that God is our helper. And the background to Psalm 46 is almost as important as the psalm itself. Because the background to Psalm 46 is a story. It is one of the most powerful, incredible, amazing stories of victory in all of the Word of God. In fact, so important is this story. The Bible tells it three times in the Old Testament. The story is told in 2 Kings 18 and 19. The story is told in 2 Chronicles 32. The story is told in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37 three times. We are told the amazing story of a king named Hezekiah and an Assyrian conqueror named Sennacherib. You see, about 725 years before the time of Christ, there was a king that came to rule in the southern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom called Judah. His name was Hezekiah. He was only 25 years old when he came to rule. And he was a good and godly king. In fact, the Bible tells us that before King Hezekiah, there was no king like him. And after King Hezekiah, there was no king like him. The Bible tells us that he walked in the ways of the Lord. And because of that, God blessed his life and God blessed his ministry. But while he was the king in the southern kingdom of Judah, way up north of the northern kingdom, north of the country of Israel, there was the dominating world power in that day. It was Assyria. And the most powerful king on the planet was a wicked, vile, evil, cruel man named Sennacherib. And Sennacherib decided he was going to come down into Israel and invade the northern kingdom, and he did. He conquered all of the cities, and he took all of the ten tribes of the north of Israel into captivity up into the land of Assyria. And then he set his sights on the southern kingdom of Judah. The Bible says in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, he conquered all of the cities of Judah except one. He conquered all 46 other cities. There was only one city left, the city of Jerusalem. And Sennacherib sent 185,000 Assyrian soldiers to surround the mountains of the city of Jerusalem, and Hezekiah and the people of God were inside. And the Assyrian soldiers began to mock Hezekiah. They began to mock the people. They began to mock the God of Israel. They began to say, you think your God will help you? That's what every other people said. And we conquered them, and we're going to conquer you too. And the Bible says that Hezekiah, he tore his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord, and he just began to pour out his prayer to God. And the Spirit of God came on Isaiah the prophet, and he went to Hezekiah. And Isaiah said, Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid of the words that you are hearing, for I will help you, and I will deliver you. 
Well, Sennacherib decided he was going to step it up a notch, and so he wrote a letter to King Hezekiah, and he sent it by messengers. And the letter said as much as the mockers. It said, you think your God is going to help you? Your God's not going to help you at all. We've conquered everybody else who depended on your God. Your God's a nobody. We're going to take you guys out just like we've taken everybody else out. You think you can depend on your God? You can't depend on your God. And the Bible says that when Hezekiah read it, he went into the house of the Lord, and he just opened the letter in front of God. And he said, Lord, look what they're writing. Look what he's saying. And again, the Spirit of the Lord came on Isaiah the prophet, and he went to King Hezekiah, and he said, Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid of the words that you have read, for I will help you, and I will deliver you. And so King Hezekiah put out the word, and he gathered all of his soldiers, and he gathered all of the people in the square in the city of Jerusalem before the temple. In 2 Chronicles 32, here's what he said. He said to all the people, Hezekiah said, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed because of the king of Assyria, nor because of the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than are with him. With him is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our help. But what happened? They went to bed that night like they had gone to bed every other night. The Lord had spoken to them. They trusted the word of the Lord, so they went to bed. And in the middle of the night, the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies, sent one angel, and at the break of dawn, that angel wiped out all 185 Assyrian soldiers so that when the people of God woke up the next morning and they went out of the city, they found their enemy dead and defeated. They had learned that our God is a very present help in whatever trouble you and I might face. Well, the Jewish tradition tells us that sometime after God had given Hezekiah that incredible victory, that he sat down and he wrote a psalm about it. It's Psalm 46. He's the one who wrote it. And the sons of Korah, the musicians uh, in later days, they were inspired by God to take this song that Hezekiah had written and put it in the Bible so that you and I could read it. And we could remember that no no matter what mountain you are facing, no matter what hill seems insurmountable to you, that our God is a helper. And he will help you through your circumstance and your situation. Look then at what Hezekiah wrote. Now knowing the backstory to the psalm, you'll understand some of what is written there. Look at what Hezekiah wrote. He wrote this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river that makes whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord. 
who has made desolations in the earth, who makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and he cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The key to this wonderful, this incredible, this beautiful, this comforting psalm is in verse 1. It is this little phrase a very present help in trouble. If you have a pen right now, I want you to underline that phrase in your Bible. Who is God? He's a very present help in trouble. When you're in trouble, he's a very present help. The word that's translated present is the word matzah in Hebrew, and Really, it's a word that you can't translate. You can't find one good English word to translate it. It not only means help when you need it, it means the kind of help you need. It not only means what you need, it means when you need it. It's a word that could be translated sufficient. <laughs> it's not just when you need the help, it's what you need. It's sufficient help. Now, if you are $1 million in debt and you say to somebody, can you help me? And they say, well, I have a quarter here. <laughs> not much help. Not sufficient help. But when you're $1 million in debt and somebody says, well, I can help you. <laughs> I got $500 million. <laughs> now we're talking help. <laughs> now we're talking sufficient help. And our God is a very present help. He's a very sufficient help. No matter what trouble you're facing, God is bigger and greater than the trouble that you are facing and able to give you exactly what you need and exactly when you need it. Now, who is God in our troubles? And what will God do for us in our troubles? Well, what I love about Psalm 46 is it gives us three pictures of who God is and what God will do. The psalm naturally divides in three parts because there's this little word, Selah. You find it at the end of verse 3. You find it at the end of verse 7. You find it at the end of verse 11. So the psalm has three parts. Verse 1 to 3, verse 4 to 7, and verse 8 to 11. And at the end of them, you find this little word, Selah, which means pause. Think about it. Three unforgettable pictures of God. The first picture is the picture of a refuge. The second picture is the picture of a river. And the third picture is the picture of a ruler. Who is God and what will he do for us in our trouble? He's a refuge. He's a river. And he's a ruler. He's a refuge. Think about it. He's a river. Think about it. He's a ruler. Think about it. The first picture the psalm gives us of God is that God is a refuge. That's what we find in verse 1 to 3. Notice in verse 1, God is our what? Circle it right now in your Bible. God is our refuge. He's our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. A refuge. When Sennacherib was coming down on Jerusalem, Hezekiah and the people, they took refuge in the city of Jerusalem, inside of its walls. But God said to them, the word of the Lord came to them, don't, don't trust in Jerusalem as your refuge. That won't help you. There is a much greater refuge 
and God is your refuge. This idea of God being a safe place that you can run into, a refuge, a shelter, you find this all over in the Bible. Here are some references in Nahum, chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, the Lord is good. He is a refuge in the time of trouble. In Proverbs, chapter 18 and verse 10, the Bible says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Isaiah says in Isaiah 25 and verse 4, O Lord, you have been our refuge a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter in the time of storm. When you face the storms of life, God is a refuge unlike any other refuge. Whenever I hear that phrase out of Isaiah 25 and verse 4 about God being a refuge in the time of storm, it reminds me of the true story of a great man of God He was a pastor over in London. His name was Dr. Herschel Hobbs. And one day Dr. Hobbs took a friend of his hunting out in the English uh, countryside. And as they were out in the countryside, all of a sudden the sky grew dark. And the lightning and thunder began to roll. And they knew they were going to be overtaken by this great storm. And so Dr. Herschel Hobbs, who'd been hunting there before, he was familiar with the countryside He grabbed his friend and he said, follow me, quick, follow me. And so his friend's trying to follow him. They're going down this winding path. They're turning left, they're turning right. They turn around this tree, around this rock, this way, that way. The further they're going, the darker it's getting, the louder the thunder is getting. His friend starts to panic. He says, where are you going? What are you doing? Where are you taking me? All of a sudden, Dr. Hobbs grabs him by the shoulders and says, quick, in here. And he shoves him inside of a cave. And just when they went in, the rain broke and the storm just dumped water down. And Dr. Hobbs looked at his friend and he said, I know you were worried about the storm. He said, but I wasn't because I knew where the refuge was. Dear ones, There are storms of life, and there are storms that are coming to this country. Do you know where the refuge is? I like what the hymn writer wrote. The Lord our rock, the Lord is our rock, in him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill betide. A shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat. A shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, (laughs) a shelter in the time of storm. O Savior strong, O refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper, always near, a shelter in the time of storm. Do you know where the refuge is? Is God your refuge? Dear ones, I'm here to tell you tonight, God is a refuge unlike any other refuge. That's what Hezekiah goes on to tell us. He says in verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though its mountains shake with its swelling. What's he talking about here? He's talking about natural disasters, the worst natural disasters you can ever imagine, an earthquake and a tidal wave. Here's Hezekiah and the people inside of Jerusalem. And Sennacherib's forces are surrounding them. And I'm sure as they heard all of those 185,000 soldiers marching, it must have made the ground feel like an earthquake. As they looked out over the walls of Jerusalem and they saw Soldiers surrounding them. It must have looked like a tidal wave coming at them. But they would learn that in the earthquakes, in the tidal waves, 
God's a refuge. He's a refuge in the worst possible situation you could ever imagine. You know, it's interesting to me, looking at natural disasters on the news that we sometimes see around the world, and, you know, people are always trying to build their houses or their office buildings or whatever to withstand the natural disasters. You know, there's an earthquake in some, you know, remote part of the world, and you look on the news at the footage of all of the rubble. Not strong enough to understand to, to withstand the earthquake. They thought it was strong enough, but not strong enough. You look at tidal waves like the one that was over in Japan, and you know the waves come rolling in, and you just see the rubble and disaster that is left after the wave has come. And you think, not strong enough. They put their trust in something that wasn't strong enough. Listen, the earthquakes are coming. The tidal waves are coming. Where's your trust? In your bank account? In the stock market? In your home? In your job? In your career? In the people around you? Dear ones, I'm here to tell you, those refuges, you can't trust in them. You can't depend on them. They're not going to be of help to you. In the, the trouble that may be in your life or the trouble that's ahead in our country. But God is a refuge that you can trust. Even in the worst possible situation, He will protect you. He will be your shelter. He will be your safe place. They tell us... <laughs> that the safest refuge on the planet, <laughs> the safest shelter on the planet, is a place in Washington, D.C., deep, 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 deep down, somewhere underneath the White House, is a place called the President's Bunker. <laughs> Many years ago, President Roosevelt was the first one to build that bunker because of the threat of nuclear war and intercontinental ballistic missiles that might be launched over, and you can't have the president dying. And so what they would do, they built this bunker, and Roosevelt or whoever, they would go down into this secret place, and there they were safe. And that president's bunker has been rebuilt many, many times. It, I was told it was rebuilt recently. Uh, it's state-of-the-art. I mean, it's got food and water and everything that you could imagine that you would ever need we don't know where it is. Psst, psst, psst. It's a secret place. <laughs> and they say it's the safest refuge on the planet. I'm here to tell you tonight there's a much safer refuge than a president's bunker. It's God. It's God. <laughs> he who abides in the secret place of the Most High God he who's in the shelter of the Almighty, they're going to find out that our God is a very present help in trouble. But Hezekiah not only tells us that God's a refuge when we're in trouble. Secondly, he tells us he's a river when we're in trouble. That's the theme of verses 4 to 7. Notice verse 4. There is a what? Circle that right now. He's a refuge, verse 1. Now in verse 4, he's a river. There's a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raised, the kingdoms were moved. He utters his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. When you're in trouble, you're going to find out that God is not only a refuge, secondly, he's a river. There is a river. Now, a careful student of the Bible or anybody who's ever taken a trip to the land of Israel, they're sort of curious about this phrase because one of the most unusual things about the city of Jerusalem is it's not built by a river. Most ancient cities were built by a river, a water source, even modern cities by a water source. But Jerusalem is unique in that it's not built by a river. You say, what do you mean there's a river that makes glad the streams of God? 
Well, though Jerusalem was not built by a river, it was built by a spring. The spring of Gihon. It was uh, just to the north and the east of the city of Jerusalem. And what would happen is the people of God, they would go out of the city of Jerusalem, their big old pot, uh, pottery jars, they would fill them with water and they would take them back in. They would go out, get the water and bring it back in, get the water, bring it back in. Get the... So they had water. But then Hezekiah hears that Sennacherib is coming down. He's taken the northern kingdom. He's taken all the rest of the city of Judah. And now he's coming after Jerusalem. And so God led Hezekiah to do something so ingenious. And that is, he had his engineers build a tunnel from the spring of Gihon underneath the wall of Jerusalem and up into the city of Jerusalem. It's now known as Hezekiah's Tunnel. If you go to the land of Israel, you can actually go through Hezekiah's Tunnel. It is an engineering masterpiece because it's not just straight. It kind of weaves around. And the workers started from either end, but somehow they met together in the middle. It was God. And right through solid rock, They made this Hezekiah's tunnel, 1,750 feet. And you can actually walk through it. I don't know if some of you have been through it. If you're claustrophobic, don't do it. (laughs) Because it's only about six feet tall and about three feet wide, and the water's, you know, three, four feet deep, and it's pitch black in there. You've got to have a flashlight or something to go along in your, I mean, there's like a line of people, and once you're in there, you can't get out. But it's very cool. You're walking through this thing and thinking, Wow. And what Hezekiah did is he put trees and rocks all around the spring of Gion so that when Sennacherib and his soldiers came, they wouldn't even know there was a spring there. And they thought, oh, we got these people. We'll just surround them and wait because they can't get any water. They don't have any water. But what they didn't know is they had a secret supply. They had a source that nobody else knew about. They had a river. They had a river. They had water flowing. And this became to them a picture of God, that God would supply everything they needed right in the midst of their trouble. There are many Bible teachers who think this is exactly what the Apostle Paul had in his mind when he wrote in Philippians 4 and verse 19, and my God will supply everything you need need. He will be your Hezekiah's tunnel. He will be your secret source that nobody else knows about and give you everything you need. Because our God is not only a refuge, he is a river, an inexhaustible river that will bring to you whatever it is that you need. As many of you know, the biggest river on planet earth is the Amazon River. You know, people talk about the L.A. River. (laughs) Not a river. (laughs) The Amazon River is 4,000 miles long. And at flood season, when it is full, there are places that it is 15 miles across the Amazon River. They tell us when it's flowing fully, that every second it spills out into the Atlantic Ocean 60,000 gallons of water. Every second. That's like, you know, 2,000 backyard swimming pools. Every second. I have a word for that. Wow! (laughs) That's a lot of water. Can you imagine then teeny little tiny daisy right at the end of the Amazon River worried and afraid that the Amazon River might run out of water to water it? The great preacher F.B. Meyer once wrote, God is to us like the Amazon River flowing to water the single daisy of our lives. When you're in trouble, you're going to find out God's everything you need. 
He's not only enough, he's more than enough. Way more than enough. More than you can imagine enough. He will supply everything you need and give you a peace that passes understanding. There was a great hymn writer of the church over in England. Her name was Frances Havergal. And she fell ill, deathly ill. They thought she was going to die. And yet, even at the prospect of death, God just gave her that sweet, precious, perfect peace that passes all understanding. It just amazed people around her. They couldn't understand, you know, how in the world can you go through all that you're going through? And it was because she understood what Psalm 46 is saying, that our God is like a river. And so God touched her and healed her. And after that, he brought her out of that deathly episode. She wrote her now famous hymn, Like a river glorious. She wrote the words, like a river glorious is God's perfect peace over all victorious in its bright increase. Perfect, yet it floweth fuller every day. Perfect, yet it groweth deeper all the way. Stayed upon Jehovah. Hearts are fully blessed, finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. But when you're in trouble, our God is not only a refuge, and he's not only a river. Thirdly, he's a ruler. And that's the theme. That's what you see in verse 8 to verse 11. Come, behold, the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and he cuts the spear in the two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is is our refuge. This is describing how God is sovereign. He's the Lord of all things. I like this in verse 8. He's the ruler over all nature, the works of the Lord. In verse 9, he's the ruler over all nations. He's sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over all people. It's like what Isaiah said in Isaiah 40. Isaiah said, uh, prophesying the word of the Lord, To whom will you liken me, says the Lord? And who is my equal, says the Holy One of Israel? Lift up your eyes and look at all that I have created. And behold, the nations, they are like a drop in the bucket. He is the ruler over all nature. He is the ruler over all nations. In Isaiah 46, Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel will stand. That's why David says in Psalm 103, The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his Kingdom rules over all. <laughs> when you're in trouble, listen, what you need to do is lift up your eyes and look. And remember that our God is not only a refuge and a river. He is the ruler over history. And he is the ruler over your life and my life. That's why Hezekiah says in verse 10, be still. Stop worrying. Cease striving. <laughs> Just calm down. You may watch the news. Probably should just turn it off. <laughs> Get you more agitated and anxious. Just turn it off. You may look at your bills. You may mull over the emails and the texts you're getting about all that is going on in your life. Listen, turn your computer off. 
Turn your cell phone off. Be still. Come before the helper God. Attach the train of your life to him. Recognize that he's in charge. He's sovereign. He is ruling. He is reigning on high. Be still. Just rest in him. Just trust in him. Just believe in him. I love the story, the wonderful story of a, an older woman of God. Her name was Agnes Smith. In World War II, she lived in London, and in World War II, the Germans were bombing the city of London night after night, every night. And one, after one terrible night of bombing, the people that were in her neighborhood, they were going from house to house trying to account for everyone. Is everyone still here? And everyone in their little neighborhood was accounted for except Agnes Smith. And they looked high and low for her, and finally they found her. She was asleep in her bed. <laughs> they woke her up, and they said, what in the world? How in the world could you sleep in all of the bombings? Weren't you afraid? Weren't you worried? Weren't you concerned? I love her answer. She said, well, no. She said, the Bible says that God who, the God who keeps his people, he never sleeps or slumbers. So I knew God was going to be up all night, so there's no reason for both of us to be up all night. I just went to bed. Be still. Be still and know that I am God, says the Lord. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And then this last phrase. Notice this last phrase in verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord of hosts. Hosts. What hosts? Well, there's one possibility. It could be the Lord of hosts, as in the host of stars. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 26, the Bible says of God, He brings out the host of heaven, and He calls them all by name. I have a word for that. Wow! Wow! The astronomers tell us 10 to the 25th power stars 10 million, billion, billion stars. Can't see them in Southern California, but <laughs> go on the desert in the middle of the night. <laughs> Take a look-see up. The God who created all that is with us. That's one possibility of what the Lord of hosts means, but that's not likely what it means because most of the time that you find that phrase, the Lord of hosts in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, Jehovah Sabaoth, it means the hosts of angels. The God of angel armies is with us. Now Hezekiah had found that out because 185,000 soldiers surrounding them and one angel took out all those 185,000 soldiers. The God of angel armies is with us. Somebody asked a great question. How many angels are there? Answer, we don't know. But a lot. In Revelation chapter 5, the apostle John saw all of the angels. And here's what he said in Revelation chapter 5. When I saw them, they were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now, that may not mean much to you, but the language in which John was writing was Greek. And in the Greek language, 10,000 was the largest number. He said, I looked at them, and you just take the largest number I know, <laughs> multiply it by the largest number I know, and then add thousands and thousands. It's like, I looked at them and there was a gazillion times a gazillion and gazillions a zillions. And just one of them dealt with Sennacherib's host. Just one of them dealt with the enemies of Hezekiah. 
But here's what I like. I pray you don't forget this. It does not say here, the hosts of the Lord are with us, even though that's true. Psalm 91, verse 11, he will give his angels charge over you. doesn't say the hosts of the Lord are with us. It says, the Lord of hosts is with us. I have a word for that. Wow! <laughs> wow! Really? Not just the angel armies, but the God of angel armies. Commentator John Phillips writes on Psalm 46, he says, Think of it. The Lord of hosts is with us. The mighty Jehovah who commands all the countless ranks of angels is on our side. One angel in one night could smite all Sennacherib's host. Right now, all of the angels of God are mustered around his throne, just ready to do his bidding, just ready to rush to your aid and mine. But the good news is better than that. Psalm 46 does not just say that the hosts are with us. It says the Lord of hosts is with us. What more could we ask than that? He writes, think of it. God is with me at the kitchen sink. God is with me as I drive through rush hour traffic. God is with me as I go to an unbearable job and face an impossible boss. God is with me in my desperate marriage and family struggles. God is with me in my current financial bind. God is with me in my loneliness and weakness. God is with me despite my faults and failures. The Lord of hosts is with me. What a wonder. What a wonder. Dear ones, I've come with good news tonight. The Lord of hosts is with you. The Lord of hosts is with you. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And when you're in trouble, and I don't know as we gather tonight what kind of trouble you might be in. It might be financial trouble. The Lord is your helper. He's going to be your helper. It might be a trouble in your marriage or in your family. The Lord is going to help you. It might be legal trouble. Maybe, you know, you're in some sort of lawsuit or something like that. The Lord's going to help you. It might be some health issue in your body or somebody you know. The Lord, he's going to help you. Listen, when you find yourself in trouble... You're going to find he's a very present help. He's a sufficient help. He'll be just what you need. And just when you need it, he will be to you a refuge. He will be to you a river. He will be to you a river, river uh, a ruler. He will be whatever it is you need. And whenever it is that you need it, God's your helper. He will help you. just like he's helped me. Two weeks ago today, I buried my precious mother of 80 years old. Two weeks ago today. And the relationship that any of us have with our mother is a very special one. And losing my mama was one of the hardest things I've ever been through. All of my mama, other than my wife, the person I have loved more on this planet than any other person is my mama. Who I am today and what I do has been shaped more by that woman than any other person. And I remember getting the news that my mama was close to going to heaven and so I flew up on a Friday and
drove right straight to the assisted living where she was in Portland, Oregon. And I sat there by my mama's bedside all Friday night and into Friday evening. And then I went back the next day, the day she died, on a Saturday. And I spent the whole day with my mama. She was unconscious and unresponsive when I got there. And most of the time, but on Saturday afternoon, all of a sudden, her eyes came open. And I said, Mama, it's Larry. It's Larry. And she looked right over at me. And I moved to the other side of the bed, and I said, Mama, Mama, it's Larry. And her eyes moved right over to where I was. And up to that point, there was no movement in her body at all. And all of a sudden, her hand started to move. And I reached down, and I grabbed hold of my Mama's hand that hand she used to hold when I was a little boy. And she just gently squeezed my hand. And I crawled up on the bed and I looked my mama in the eyes. I said, Mama, I love you. You've been a good mama. I'll see you in heaven, Mama. I'll see you in heaven. And not long after that, my mom was gone. And the next day on Sunday, I had to fly back here to California because of teaching responsibilities. And so I taught Monday morning my class and taught Monday night my class and then went home and repacked my suitcase, gathered my wife, and we drove to LAX very early in the morning. And we got into the terminal. We were waiting there. And my wife said, I'm going to go get some coffee. I said, OK. And so I was just you know, there among the seats, and I I was so tired. And so I decided I just, you know, I'll just lay down for a minute. And I didn't have a pillow. So I just pulled out my Bible and I laid it on the seat and I just laid my head down on the Bible. Pulled my jacket up over the top of my head. And as I was laying there, I thought, you know, this is such a picture of my whole life just laying on God's word, just putting my head on the book of all books. And as I was laying there under my jacket in the middle of that noisy terminal, I began to pray, Lord, please help me. I need your help. I need your help. right there in that terminal, that noisy terminal, underneath my jacket with my head on my bed, God was to me a refuge. God was to me a river. God was to me a ruler. He is my helper. I attached the train of my life to him, and he pulled me up and over. But to me, was a hill I didn't think I could climb. And what God did for me, he'll do for you, no matter what trouble you're in, no matter what circumstance you're facing. You'll find, as God's people have always found, he's our helper, our helper when we're in trouble. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for our study in your word tonight. We thank you so much for this amazing psalm, knowing the story and the meaning of it, so blesses and encourages our hearts. Lord, right now, as we just take a moment to pray together, to not just be hearers of your word, but to be doers of your word, we pray you would move by your spirit in this place. In Jesus' name we pray.